Now to further take this idea, this analog of sonata form, um, I have now laid a different way of looking at it. I have Beethoven's Ninth Symphony here in the next slide. And you'll see that I have now laid over, instead of sonata, well I do have the sonata form, and I have Beethoven's Life Struggle as epitomized in the Heiligenstadt Testament. And here are his four movements, Allegro Scherzo, Adagio, and Finale. And I have laid them over with looking at it as a way that he would have been essaying his own life with the Ninth Symphony. And we see the Allegro uh, with the desire versus deafness leading to despair. The Scherzo where the battle is on taken up and a solution is arrived at at the end of Scherzo. In Adagio, we see nothing but serenity in there, the place where we have resolved our desire and our deafness, and then the finale of joy and triumph. One way of looking at this, one of the questions that musicians and, and enjoyers of music have asked is, why did Beethoven put the second and third movements where, where they are now. Usually in this, this uh, either three or four movement or even five movement form of symphonies or sonatas, we would have the slow movement be in the second position and the scherzo in the third position, being that it has come out of the minuet tradition. And, and clearly all of Beethoven's previous symphonies follow this order. You have a fast beginning, then you contrast immediately in the second movement with the slow and serene aria type movement, followed by the musical joke, something very energetic, leading to, in the case of romantic symphonies, the triumphal or the very stormy ending, very fast. Um, and Beethoven, it's really quite, quite a mystery why he would switch these things. In essence, what he has done is he has loaded all the action of this movie into the front half. And the trend is, as the 19th century goes by, to load the action to the back half. And, and truly, in movies, we'll usually get a splash, and then they need to keep you intact. They will move stuff towards the end of the piece. But in this case, he's moved these forward. But what I see is that if he's looking at his life, the action there, so to speak, is in the first two movements, leading to the point of it all, this adagio with serenity, and then out of that comes this uh, actually triumph and joy for not only Beethoven, but for all of mankind. And so this leads us to, the, we'll look at each of the movements now on the next slide here. We see the Allegro, the first movement, in the key of D minor, and we have the two themes. And so we see one of them we might say is representing the desire and one's the deafness. So the symphony starts out, uh, some have said it's like creation, but... So you hear the horns of battle. So we have this theme, this. So this is probably not the serenity of desire. <laughs> this must be the, the this passion of deafness. And it is contrasted with theme two, which is then set instead of in this fiery D minor, it comes into a B flat major and it comes in this way. Last little bit here, that's a G flat in there. Keep that in mind, that's a very important note in terms of the desire and the sweetness of wanting to create. But so this, this B flat, as opposed to the, those are the two, and they, they do battle. I, we don't have time to go through, I'd love to take you through the whole thing. They go through this whole thing, you'll see that there is 
uh, development in a lot of keys. He tries the two themes in various ways in different keys. They transition, and when they come back, you see that there's been a, there's something strange as far as a uh, a um, sonata form goes. Theme one returns as it was in the beginning, but theme two comes back. It has taken on part of the characteristics of theme one by being in D, but it's in major instead of minor and has refused to take on all the aspects that the deafness have created. And we have this, but things are not settled yet, and the code is very unstable. And it goes back into the D minor, in essence, that the depression is gathering back over Beethoven. And he takes that theme, and he turns it into like a funeral march. And underneath is one of the scariest bass lines. And I go. And this goes on and builds, and it builds towards the end of this, this epic battle. Battle is joined. The depression is there. And where does what does the battle sound like on the next slide? And but it's not a battle of swords. It's a battle of the mind. And this goes on and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds into. And here, I'll move to the next slide. And we see that this battle thing, now we understand why the scherzo has moved into the second position, because of course it's coming out of the whole idea and the whole conflict that was set up in the first movement. So we're finding that we're having like a sonata form on top of a sonata form. The movements are sonata, this is a sonata. And here we see that we have this theme one in D minor, contrasted with theme two, which is in C major. And that's the one, the uh, very gentle, but they go back and forth between the and so uh, just as in like all scherzos, Beethoven shifts the rhythm back and forth since it's in a fast three, there'll be things put in four, such as like this. And it goes into four, and then we get this wonderful trio theme. And he goes through, and he goes and develops that little trio theme. And uh, we find this has become more of a scherzo than it is a, a sonata. But at the end, he's got this great ending where it comes through. Just ends up in the air. Pretty victorious ending, and so ends the second movement.